Wow, lovely to be here. Excuse my accent. I'll try and talk slowly if you don't understand me. <laughs> I spend my life with the crazy ones, the entrepreneurs who don't see the word impossible as existing, the people who are trying to take us forward, building solutions to the problems we face in healthcare, in education, in communicating with each other effectively. So what I'm going to do in the next 30 minutes is translate some of the ideas and the mindsets that I see among these extraordinary individuals who are pushing the limits. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can learn from them, how we can build our own audiences, our own brands, how we can make some more money out of it. And also, I'm going to talk about how to spot the future in technology and how to spot what isn't the future. Um, so I'm talking about you know, 10 ways to stay ahead of tech innovation, um, but also to know, especially if you're in the communications business, what works. But first, I want to get a sense from you in the room about how quickly tech is advancing. I just want to get an indication, just with your hands. Who here thinks there will be entrepreneurs selling us flying cars in maybe 10 years? Hands up. Okay, so it's just a handful of hands. What about 15 years? A few more of you. So what's really interesting is there are already startups who don't see a limit who are building flying cars. This is one in Central Europe, in Slovakia, called Aeromobil. And it's just a bunch of people with an idea, with access to crowdfunding, you can get money. With access, they don't have their own factories. You can get capacity in other people's factories. This was science fiction, what, a couple of years ago? This is now a product. This is the prototype they released only in October. So I love the fact that we're in a world now where Robotics is advancing. This is a company called Boston Dynamics, started as a DARPA kind of project. Google bought them last year. They love kicking their dogs. I'm assured no robot dogs were harmed in the making of this film. But just look at the detailing of this, and very soon, this becomes consumer product. We did a story in Wired in the current issue. In medical science, this woman is paralyzed. She's tetraplegic, but she has an implant in her brain that communicates directly with a robot arm, so for the first time she can control her food and drink. So this is why technology makes me an optimist. It can solve real problems. And everywhere you look, the future is coming. This gentleman was on the space station recently, needed a tool. It was emailed to him as an attachment and then printed on a 3D printer inside the space station. So, we're at one of these moments where there's this exponential curve changing our realities in real time. And you hear a lot, particularly in Silicon Valley, about the exponential era. So we know about Moore's law, doubling computer processing power every 18 months, two years. Um, that hasn't yet reached the limits of physics. It's coming close. But it means you can get computers the size of a grain of sand. This is one out of the University of Michigan. But it's not just in computer processing that things are changing and creating new business opportunities. This is the falling cost of sequencing human DNA, that green line falling at one of those exponential curves, actually quicker than the Moore's Law straight line. So what 10 years ago was maybe $100 million is now a couple of hundred dollars, is soon going to be zero. And that has implications. So it has implications for healthcare. You can target individuals, but also maybe for the state. It can track individuals. Tiny bit of saliva on a glass, you know who somebody is. So we've got to have debates about the implications of these things as they become ubiquitous. And in an exponential era, things are different. The last century, things moved in a fairly linear way. If you count it to 30, 1 plus 1 plus 1, you get to 30. But what happens in an exponential era where you're doubling at each step? By 30, you get to a billion. New realities, new possibilities, new threats to existing business models and existing ways of thinking. And you don't always know where you are on that curve until it's too late. And it changes the reality. Let's say computer storage, which has come down pretty much to zero. Let's say 1994, storage is $1,000 per gig, right? I say to you, let's start a business where we give away computer storage. Let's call it Dropbox. We'll be billionaires. You'd have laughed. But realities change because 
you don't always see that curve rising as steeply as it does. It changes the sorts of companies that succeed on one of those curves. 20 years ago, it took a couple of decades to get into the Fortune 500. Now, it's taken maybe a year and a half. Companies like Waze, companies like, like WhatsApp, in the billion dollar club very quickly. And also, the speed at which consumers are adopting new technologies is accelerating. So I'm telling you this to set the context that we are in an era that's moving ever fast, and technology is coming from the edge, moving mainstream very quickly. So the Google self-driving car, this is the Google video of the blind guy driving the car to pick up some tacos. It was a research project that's going to be real. It's going to be on our roads. I was talking to the head of sales for BMW a few weeks ago. I said, how long until you'll be selling completely self-driving cars? Six years. Think of drones. You used to have to be the military to have a drone. Tens of millions of dollars. Now, for a couple of hundred dollars, you can get a drone. This is somebody filming the earthquake in Nepal last week. They put the video on Facebook. Now, the news organizations are using this. The high quality imaging, it changes the rules. You know, no longer, if there is a demo, can the government say, we want no media, because you can send in a drone. So, let me give you a little thought experiment. Do you remember this gadget? 1983, cool new gadget hits the market, celebrity endorses, but let's say you are the incumbent, you are AT&T, you are the biggest provider of landlines in the world, you have millions of miles of copper cable. Business opportunity or threat? Do you invest or do you ignore? So AT&T didn't know, so they call in McKinsey, the consultants, and they say, Tell us how many of these mobile telephone devices you think there'll be in America by the end of the 20th century, by the year 2000. And McKinsey goes away and does its calculation and says, well, we think it could be quite significant. We think maybe by the end of the century there could be almost a million mobile telephones in America. Which wasn't a bad guess, but it was slightly out. And there's three things McKinsey got wrong that I want you to understand when you're starting to think about is a technology relevant. First of all, it forgot Moore's law. The form factor changes very quickly, and the use case changes when something's like this. Secondly, they thought of it as a technology. And in fact, the tech that catches on is not technology at all. It's an extension of our identity. It's something emotional. This is beautiful. It connects us with our loved ones. You see videos of your kids. You enjoy yourself whilst waiting for the plane. You play. And third, McKinsey framed their thinking in a very 1983 way when the social norms were different. The social norms in 1983, if you wanted to make a phone call, you would go and find a phone box. You would go back to the office. You would go home. Take any 14-year-old now. Hold their phone away from them for at least six seconds, and it's a human rights abuse. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a very quick tour through 10 of the trends, and I want to start with this one, which is don't see things as technology. If you want to connect with people, just go for the most human way of doing it. Wearable technologies, we're, to we're told, are going to be huge. But think about you know, what wearable technologies have been. Would you be comfortable as a human walking down the street with your Google Glass? Probably not. It's fine for an industrial task. But think, does this enhance your identity? And what do we mean, anyway, by the new way we're going to connect with the network through wearables? Wearables are more likely to be the stuff you would wear. So think of the human side of tech. This is a company called OmSignal in Europe that makes sensors inside clothes. They're working with people like Ralph Lauren. Um, so the sensors in this gentleman's top say his heart rate, how many steps he's taken, his breathing rate. It even claims to know his mood. This gentleman is currently excited. Wearable tech, the stuff you would already wear, okay? You ski, you wear the goggles, right? The recon ski visor projects data in front of you, how fast you've gone, where you are, the weather. That is more likely to catch on. Think of Disney and their magic band, which helps you jump the cues, which when you're in the cafe, it knows which food the waitress should bring to, that, to you. This is a huge bet for Disney. It connects you, the individual, to the network. This is a product, this is where wearables, I think, do catch on. It's called the Nymi. 
you wear it on your wrist, it tracks your individual heartbeat pattern. Everybody has a slightly different one. And it uses it to authenticate you, to get you into the car, into the computer. This is more likely because it solves a problem. It gets rid of friction. And this probably won't work. This is a London company called Ease that's trying to solve the payments problem, okay? You don't want to get your credit card out, so you wear the Google Glass on the date, the waitress presents the bill as a QR code, and you have to nod twice. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing, but he gets the girl, okay? Um, I don't think this is the future. And then interesting things happen. You know, virtual reality becomes mainstream. Companies like Oculus Rift, which Facebook bought, are coming to market with really immersive products. If you haven't seen virtual reality, you have to experience it for yourself. And it changes the norm very quickly. Microsoft has Where your digital its HoloLens. Is this is with your projecting holograms onto the eye. This is another product now that's about to hit the market. This is the world with holograms. You see, you can't really go backwards when you've experienced this. This is a company that's had, talk about free enterprise, half a billion dollars of funding. It's called Magic Leap. We don't know what the product is. They've just put these mysterious videos online. It may involve <laughs> flying miniature elephants. I don't know. But I love you know, the spirit of capitalism. These people are betting big, half a billion dollars on a future. And then augmented reality. That was virtual reality. This is a company in Stockholm called 13th Lab that knows where you are, great visuals on the phone. You can shoot your colleagues in the office if they've stolen your coffee cup. But think of the high definition of this. There's no going back. I'm not condoning violence, OK? Oculus Rift just bought that company. Um, one of the other big things that's happening is, you know, we all know that the desktop era is over and mobile is the future. But think about the economic opportunities. Think about, you know, we're now checking our apps so many times a day, there are apps to tell you how many times a day you're checking your apps. <laughs> there are new medical conditions. This is called the three-dot anxiety, when you're so impatient to see what the other person's typing on your iPhone that you get stressed. Um, selfies are old news, by the way. Belfies are the ones you need now. This is a real product to take a picture of your rear end and share it on social media. This is possibly the end of civilization. <laughs> um, but just think how central that mobile device is. And if you are communicating, that is how you need to target your message. Bloomberg Businessweek did a little project recently. Everything that the mobile phone has stopped you having to buy, you know, from the alarm clock and the torch. It's kind of crazy how quickly we've taken it for granted. Talk about business models. Kim Kardashian comes up with a free phone game last summer. You can live her lifestyle if that's what you desire. You can buy a bit of stuff inside the game to go faster, but it's free. Within five months, she had made $43 million. New economic models, because of the mobile and the app store. Jan Koum, a guy I got to know, came to America as a refugee from communist Ukraine, age 16, living on food stamps. Got very frustrated how expensive it was phoning home his family in Kiev. Eventually, through tech, he comes up with an app. You probably know where this story goes. WhatsApp, bought by Facebook this time last year. At a time, it had almost half a billion active monthly customers. Facebook pays $19 billion. How much did Jan Koum spend in the four years to get his half a billion customers on advertising plus marketing plus PR? New world. Make a product. It's it just works, it's simple, it takes off. And you know, everybody is going to be on the network now. Phones are going right down in price. You can get a smartphone now for $25. Google and other companies are putting these balloons up to give connectivity to parts of the world that haven't been reached. So the mobile is the way the next couple of billion are going to be connected, and you've got to work out how to reach them. One of the other things you need to do is whatever business you're in, if you're working for yourself, if you're working for a big company, you have to think in the same way the startups are thinking now. At Facebook, they have these posters in the office in Northern California. Um, and this is how these guys are thinking. You know, move fast and break things. Get products out there. Done is better than perfect. Don't perfect it. Just get it out, and we'll take feedback, and we'll make it better. Even questioning what kind of business this is. Is this a technology company? Somebody scribbled, no, it's a poster-making company. 
I was this morning in Atlanta at Chick-fil-A, big fast food restaurant, a couple of thousand branches, and a chicken chain is now trying to turn itself into a startup. They have innovation labs. They have um, this place where you can go, it's called The Hatch, and experiment with food. And I think it's really interesting. You're going to have a lot more companies realize they need to challenge their own assumptions, invent new products, prototype, test things, work with startups. One of the other things I think we need to do if we're going to be successful in getting our messages out there is get rid of the noise. The internet commodifies so many businesses. It's free to get music online, right? Nobody needs to pay for it. Daniel Ek creates a business out of Stockholm called Spotify where he offers a service people will pay for. It's just had a funding round today valued at about $8 billion offering the chance for you to pay each month to get access to a trustworthy, reliable source of music. So it's easy. It saves the hassle. Same thing with the iTunes store. It kind of killed the need to use piracy. And think of all the things that the internet doesn't do well, and think how you, if you're creating a media platform, if you're creating a consultancy, if you're creating any kind of business, this is what you can offer competing with a commodity internet. The internet is not good at design, it's not good at depth if you offer that layer of analytics. At the same time, it's a really interesting moment of transition. Um, and I promised I wasn't going to get into politics because I know we're not allowed to do that. But I want to bring in a little bit of politics. Um, but only because we are at this classic moment where hierarchy, the idea that somebody's in charge, is moving very quickly to a network. And it's not quite what the communists wanted to do, but it's what connecting everybody to a network through ubiquitous devices changes the power structure. And in fact, it gives power back to the people, bypasses governments, we're back in the days of, you know, the homebrew computer club where anybody could tinker and you could come up with new products like the first Apple computer. Um, we're going to that stage with all sorts of sectors, from hardware to software, and the access to markets, the loss of barriers to entry, is really transformative. Um, if you want to make hardware, you can go to a tech shop, huge space the size of this room. You can access 3D printers, sewing machines, laser cutters, People are starting businesses as individuals through these places. Quirky, a crowd of amateur inventors. Anybody can go to the platform, propose a product. You can get it built if the crowd thinks it's worthwhile. They're even now working with GE, the world's biggest industrial company. GE has realized it doesn't have all the expertise. It doesn't have all the smart people. It's giving Quirky's crowd access to all its IP to try and create new products that GE hadn't thought about. I think that's really exciting. I was in Kuwait a few weeks ago. This is where the sheep farmers of Kuwait now trade their sheep on an Instagram page. These are real phone numbers if you want to buy a sheep for your loved one for a birthday present. Um, nobody gave them permission. The network connects people. There's nobody in charge. Hierarchy going to network. We did a story about this gentleman, Eric Migakowski, a great free market entrepreneur. He wants to make a smartwatch a couple of years before Apple said they wanted to. He doesn't have a factory, he doesn't have an expert team, just a group of friends. So he goes to Kickstarter, tells the network, hey, we think this could be quite cool. We need $100,000. The crowd loves it, $1.3 million come in. Last month, he went to Kickstarter for the next version of the Pebble watch. He said, we need $500,000 for this one. More than $20 million. The rules have changed. Can anybody guess what all these companies have in common? Games company, dating company, travel company. Anybody want to shout out a guess? Uh, I haven't heard it from anyone. These all accept a new kind of currency created by the crowd that doesn't actually look like this because Bitcoin doesn't have coins, it's virtual, and no bank controls it. And in fact, you can trust it more than any bank, 
because it's got this distributed ledger of the record of everything called the blockchain connected with it. And so this is starting to shake up every bank. They're terrified. They wonder what's going to happen. Governments are starting to think, how do we regulate this thing? You can send currencies across border. It empowers the individual in a really interesting way. It empowers micropayments. The big investors in the valley are putting big money into this. A few more of these rules. Um, I think you're pretty good at this because I've seen all the social media activity just for um, today's event right online. But just think of what somebody like Michelle Fan is doing. Starts in her bedroom talking about makeup, creates a YouTube channel. So far, more than a billion views. And then sets up a makeup company, Ipsy, bringing in about $10 million a month by knowing what the crowd wants. You don't have to go through conventional media channels. This is Castrol. They put a three-minute commercial for a new oil, not on a TV channel, but on social media, on YouTube. In a couple of days, four million people had seen it. Again, new rules. A few more things I think you need to do, which I'm seeing the smart media companies doing. Um, data analytics is emerging as one of the most powerful tools. It told Netflix that there was a market for a political drama, because they had the data based on what people were watching. They wouldn't have known as human beings, as experts, but they looked at the data. We did a cover story about BuzzFeed. This is Jonah Peretti, the founder. They monitor data with everything. They have dashboards, everybody in the building, to know how a story is being shared. Is it on social media? Is it people coming directly? What kind of device are they using? They tweak the headlines. We got them even to pose in my favorite ever headline. This is the BuzzFeed staff outside their office. They even come up with like details. They measure, they iterate. A URL like this, they make sure you can tell from the URL what the story is. If you think of Upworthy, again, another new site, it's all about measurement. It's all about data analytics. Why did these two stories about the same thing get different numbers of page views? Why did one get 100 times what the other one? They didn't know as editors, but they test, A-B test, and they put the headline that works best up. So can anybody here guess which of these stories from Upworthy, A or B, will get the most views? Okay, you seem to think A. It was A, 32 times the number of clicks. That's not science, that's seeing what the market wants in real time and providing what the market wants. And so the analytics that we've had online is now coming offline. There is no offline anymore, everything's connected. There are companies like this working in retail. This is a company called Shopperception that tracks individual companies, individual customers to know what makes a conversion. It's all artificial intelligence, algorithms, monitoring to help you. Online and offline connected. This was a fun campaign British Airways had at Piccadilly Circus in London. They know when each individual plane is going overhead. So we have to start thinking now, there is no online, there is no offline, it's all, it's all one. John Chambers talks about this internet of connected things as a $19 trillion opportunity. He's the head of Cisco. And it's quite interesting where this is going to go. We're all connecting ourselves to the network, right? Or to our dogs. Or any device now has to be a connected device with sensors in, the basketball that tells your phone how good your shots are. The streetscape, we did a project at Wired, what happens when everything is connected? The taxi knows your directions based on your online schedule, or the sandwich store knows you're coming near, knows your preference, starts to make your avocado and chicken sandwich before you get there. Or probably more important, the phone, the smartphone warns you of an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend ahead so you can cross the street to avoid it. <laughs> We're getting sensors in med medicine. This is a company called Proteus that puts a digestible pill on your medicine, so it tells your device that you've taken your medication. What about aviation? What this is an Accenture and GE project. It improves the lives of everyday people. One of the things that the consumer may not see today is just how complex airline operations are. 
typical airline, 600 plus planes, 3,000 routes every day, complex network. It is humanly impossible when there's a major disruption for somebody to figure out what the optimal approach is and get them back on schedule. With this joint venture between GE and Accenture, the industry finally has the ability to predict in advance any kind of problem that an aircraft might have. Our objective is to help the airlines avoid all forms of unplanned delight through both maintenance, where we are predicting what's happening on the aircraft, but also through the operations side, where we're giving the airlines early warning of what's happening. There's a number of sensors on this for control, so when it's running, you can know various things about its performance. So that's wired through the aircraft, and then it comes off on the wireless quick access recorder links, and then we can do the processing and we can send the airlines the results. It's huge amounts of data coming off of every aircraft, and our technology understands the different behaviors and is able to predict and prevent a delay from happening, and when it does, recover from that delay as quickly as possible to get back into the day-to-day -day operations. So what's happening in aviation is going to happen in every single sector. Data analytics, artificial intelligence combining in real time, the network gets smarter. A couple more rules. Um, sometimes the internet changes what works as a business model. I used to work in newspapers. Remember newspapers? <laughs> but there's ways of making money out of it. So there was a book called The Curve, published last year, which looked at how you can go from free, that gets lots of people in, to a few people who will pay a lot. And the author of the book gave away e-versions, but then gradually, more expensive, started to do consulting and masterclasses. I think this is quite intriguing. So we have to think we can use the network to reach potentially millions of people. Maybe they won't pay. Maybe we should build really loyal fans who will pay in new ways. Amanda Palmer, the musician, went to crowdfunding and offered, you know, for a dollar you could get the MP3s, but for a thousand dollars you could have tea with her. For ten thousand dollars she'd come and pay at your party. A few deep loyalists like that. I'm not sure if I'm allowed the Atlantic at this event, but let's forget <laughs> liberal media. I just want to talk about how magazines that have had financial trouble surviving have reinvented themselves by creating events where people pay high ticket prices. It's a new business model. This is a magazine coming out of Europe. Again, very thick. You're not going to make money out of the magazine, right? So they've created lifestyle stores where you can buy you know, really expensive slippers because they've got a community they built up around loving the brand. And I think it's working out what is the value that your product offers. You know, Condé Nast, which publishes Wired, has set up a college of fashion in London. You know, it's got Vogue magazine. The brand is something that lends itself to education. Who'd have known? People are paying thousands of dollars to go on courses. We at Wired, we have a consulting business. We have an events business. That's how we're making increasing proportions of our revenue, because advertising, well, it's not going to be what it was five years ago. We even have this thing called the bat phone, we call it. Um, companies pay us to have monthly calls to get a sense of what is going on and how it will affect them. So we've had to rethink. In fact, every industry that's being commoditized by the network is having these challenges. This is a telco. This is actually in Africa, in Ghana. But every time you top up there, you get a bit of life insurance. They've done a deal with an insurer. So it changes the nature. They're not selling you a top up. They're protecting your family. Who'd want to run a bookshop now? Awful business, right? This is a bookshop in Mayfair in central London. It's got the royal coat of arms. Been there since the 1930s. They have decided the value they add to the network is not selling books. It's books expertise. So they will build you a custom library. They just finished a ski chalet in Switzerland. 3,000 books. They charged about $800,000. That's interesting. Why would a car company, this is Daimler, sponsor an annual car-free day? Because they realized not everybody wants to buy a car. Some people just want access to a car, so they create a car club. Commodified product, right? HD camera. Millions of companies making HD cameras. How can this one charge so much more? GoPro. Because it's, a, it's not a camera company, it's a media company. You, Upload your video of yourself using the company's camera, living the lifestyle, skiing into avalanches on their website. And so they've repositioned themselves. Don't try this at home, please. <laughs> Couple more. 
commodified world, what works is a smooth, trustworthy experience. I can download lots of movies without paying, but it's a mess, and you don't know if you're going to pick up viruses. That is a designed experience. Think of everything that Uber has thought of to keep you in the system. Even when you sign on for the first time, you don't have to type in your credit card number. You photograph your credit card, and it does the work for you. That's their latest valuation. TED, again, it took a risk. It put the videos online. Giving away TED, even having the TEDx, the local TEDs, the amateur organizers can create. But they still charge $9,000 for the full experience of actually going to the TED event, because the experience is what brings people together. And the final rule, I think, is in whatever sector you're in, however you're getting your message out there, you need to keep challenging yourself and innovating. And how do you do that? Um, companies like Pixar do it with their buildings. Steve Jobs, when he took over, decided there should be one central atrium with the toilets, the bathrooms, so that all the different skill sets, the accountants need to meet the animators. It gets that conversation going. In downtown Las Vegas, 20 miles from the Strip, not a very nice atmosphere, pretty run down. Um, Tony Shea, who founded Zappos, the online shoe retailer, sold to Amazon for a billion dollars, is trying to revive it by spending $350 million of his own money bringing together startups, creating new public theaters, bringing in cool restaurants. And he's talking about creating this by the three Cs, bringing collisions together, creating a common space where people meet, where they learn together, and where they're connected. I think in all our organizations, we need to find a way to bring collisions in. It's this kind of burning man idea that you bring 70,000 people into the desert for a week. They don't even have a cash economy, but amazing creative things happen, and then they go away. In fact, in workspaces, there's places like this in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Grid 70, this place, where different companies don't just share the same floor, but they share the same meeting rooms, and they can go into each other's meetings. You know, still case, a furniture company, Wolverine, a boots company, they're not competing, but they know they can learn from each other. Um, because I say all this, because I don't want you to end up with what happened to Stephen Sasson, who in 1975 invented this, which was the world's first digital camera, which was great, except he worked here, and it threatened their business model, so they buried it. Kodak once had 140,000 employees, goes into bankruptcy three years ago. At the time, a 13-person company is bought by Facebook for a billion dollars, because that's what the company does. It helps you share. It's not about taking the picture. Whereas these guys, they saw the light. They were in the same position, and they realized, well, maybe our expertise is not developing pictures. Maybe it's imaging knowledge. They created a medical imaging unit. They knew about light. They created a cosmetics unit. Fujifilm have done OK. These guys had the chance to be a streaming service in 1999. They weren't interested. They forgot Moore's law. Streaming becomes cheaper, broadband, more powerful. I'm going to leave you with this. This came out in 2007. The head of a tech company that made mobile phones was asked on TV what he thought about it. $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes. How did that work out, Steve Ballmer of Microsoft? Um, so, to end, I'm in the media, old media, kind of difficult business to be in, right? So, we make a beautiful paper magazine. We make apps, we have websites, but I need to think of disrupting ourselves. Because I don't know how the next generation you know, is going to cope when they grow up with these screens. This is the new reality. See, the problem with a paper magazine is you can't pinch and zoom it. <laughs> you can't swipe it. Um, but this is my new reality, and I have to be where she's going to be, because she's going to be the future. Thank you for listening. <laughs>